Good morning. morning. Glad you're here this morning. And for those online, glad you're worshiping with us. Glad you're worshiping with us online also. I can get the words out. Um, As we get started, just a few announcements. And first, um, choir is starting back up. And choir starting this Wednesday night. It's from seven to eight. It's only an hour, and we've got. Um, a lot of exciting things coming up, and we're going to sing for Roundup Sunday next week. So be sure and come. Um, on uh, next Saturday, um, I actually thought it was going to be this Saturday, and I was like, oh, nope. I texted, and it's like, nope. We're going to have United Methodist Men's Breakfast next um, Saturday. Um, so for men, come on and have breakfast. Um, and then next Sunday, we're going to have our Roundup Sunday and barbecue lunch. So bring a friend or someone who hasn't been around for a while. And then September 17th, we'll have our um, Theology on Tap just up at Sean's Cummings um, Irish Pub just up the street. 17th? 17th? It should, it's the Thursday should be. 14th. 14th? Okay. I had that wrong. 14th is right here, and that's wrong up there. <laughs> You're right. It's the 14th. Um, so, yeah. Are there um, other announcements that need to be made? Bring desserts um, for next Sunday for your, our um, barbecue dinner. Um, today, uh, we have a loop in the gospel lesson. We have a whiplash moment where Jesus first says, Peter, you did a good job. Um, here's the keys to the kingdom. And the next thing we know, Jesus is saying, get behind me, Satan, to Peter. Um, we all have those moments. <laughs> and Peter had it right there. And that's what we're going to look at today. Let's go to God in prayer. Holy God, we thank you for your presence and how you come to us. We thank you for the times when we say the right thing and we do the right thing and for the other times when you tell us to try again. (laughs) Help us and guide us to get behind you, to follow where you lead, that we may spread the seeds of your kingdom for all to see. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our gathering hymn. Please join me in the call to worship. Have you heard God's call in your life? There are so many directions in which we are being pulled. Some of these paths are falsely enticing and others dangerous. Look to Jesus. He will be your guide and Holy Spirit will guard your life. Give thanks to God with all your heart. Please join in our opening hymn. Spring. 
Please join me in the opening prayer. God of mystery, we are constantly amazed by the depth and breadth of your love. Over and over again, you turn our expectations inside out and upside down. And still, we don't understand the radical nature of your grace. We play by our own rules of justice, even when it means excluding those who are called in love and defend. In our darkest moments, we doubt if we are worthy of your trust. God, help us remember that you give us all the tools we need that through the solid foundation of your love, we find the strength to follow your call as true disciples of Jesus Christ. Surprise us again, O oh God. Amen. I invite the children to come forward for a children's conversation. <laughs> started school back, right? So I'm guessing, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that on one of the first days of school, your teacher sat down with you, and maybe your music teacher and your art teacher and stuff as well, and shared with you the classroom rules, right? <laughs> Does ever, no rules in your classroom at all? None? You know the rules, okay, because you've been taught them over the years, right? Well, for our scripture, one of our scripture verses today is from Paul, who was kind of like a teacher in the early church. And he wrote a letter to the people of Rome, the early Christians who were just learning what it meant to follow Christ. And one of the verses that we have is his classroom rules <laughs> for how to be a Christian. So we're going to look over these. Does somebody want to read one of them? Read the first one. Brooklyn, read the first one. Treat every person as a friend. Good rule, right? Anybody else want to read the next one? Go ahead, May. Always do what is right. Anybody want to read the next one? Okay, I can go through them. Help people when they need your help. It's a good rule, right? The next one says, pay attention to people's feelings. Laugh with those who are happy and comfort those who are sad. The next one says, do not act stuck up or think you are smarter than you are. Ask God to be good to people who give you trouble. That's a tricky one, right? When someone in the classroom maybe or in life is not being nice, God says to go ahead and maybe pray for that person. Do not try to get even with people who are mean to you. Instead, treat them kindly. 
And the last one that Paul wrote says, do not give in to evil ideas or planned plans. Instead, find good ideas and good plans. So those are the rules, some of the rules. There's a lot, but some of the ones that Paul wrote that he thought might be good ideas for the people who were early Christians who were just learning what it meant to be kind and good to one another. So anyway, as you guys think about what it means to be a Christian, these are probably pretty similar to what you have in your classroom rules, right? Yeah, exactly. So you can take all of these rules and just apply them to all the things that are going on in life and as you deal with your friends at school and at home and as you deal with your siblings. I know I was getting on to Fisher in Brooklyn today because they were not being kind to one another and I read one of these to Fisher and lectured him. <laughs> so anyway, these are good rules for us to follow. So let's say a prayer. God, we thank you for Paul and for the other teachers in the early church who helped set us guidelines and rules for what it means to be good Christians, how to take care of one another, how to treat each other kindly, and help us remember these rules when we are dealing with our friends and family, whether we're at home or out in the world or in the classroom at school. We know that you guide and direct us and are with us everywhere we go. Thank you so much. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our first reading this morning is from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Pursue hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those that weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be arrogant. But associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. But take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please join in our hymn of preparation. I had to Take refuge. Don't let me be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Hear my cry. Rescue me. Be my refuge. A strong fortress. Save me. You are my rock, lead me, guide me, keep me free from the trap set for me, you are my refuge, my protection, I put my spirit, my soul into your hands, deliver me. I am so afraid and alone. My mind is consumed with distress. 
My body and soul is weakened by grief and sorrow. O oh God, be merciful to me. I am forgotten. I have become broken pottery. But I trust you, God. You are my creator and deliverer. Save me. Shine your light on me. Save me through your love. God, can you hear my cry? I trust in you, Lord. You are my God. You are my refuge. I will find shelter in your presence. You are my safe dwelling place. Hear my cry for mercy, God. I need your help. I trust in your faithfulness, God. I love you. And my hope is in you. Our gospel lesson comes to us from the 16th chapter of Matthew, starting at verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man has come with his angels in the glory of Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The kingdom of God, the way of life goes through death. Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Such a confusing phrase. The kingdom of God is a bizarre, upside-down world. Whoever is concerned to secure their own life will lose it, but the one that actually loses his own life is the one that finds it. Jesus' way to save human beings went through death. In the same way, for us, our way to abundant life goes through death. Those who love their life will lose it, while those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. This is more than dying to ourselves. We must also die to our egotism and our own selfishness. When Jesus announced to the crowd that he would build his church on Peter and give to Peter the keys to God's realm, Peter must have felt like he was walking on air. Can't you see Peter's chest swelling? Had pride, too wonderful to disguise. He had 
left his livelihood to take on a new life with Jesus. He had left the simple comforts of home to take on a tough life on the road. He had left the familiar, well-worn routine to take on the uncertainties of a whole new life. And now, finally, everything was paying off. It comes, Jesus rewards him with his own set of keys to the kingdom. Then Jesus ruins the moment. He tells Peter and the other guys, look, the road to Jerusalem is filled with nails. They'll pierce me and put an end to me. But after three days, God will reclaim my life. And Peter takes him aside and says, come on, come on, man, come to your senses. Don't you remember I just pronounced you the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God? These things don't happen to God. God forbid they ever happen to you. They must never happen. Because that would mean that would happen to us and those who follow you. Was the subtext there. Someone like Peter and the disciples. Peter's brief taste of his dream world came to an embarrassing halt when Jesus barked back at Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You are a scandal, a stumbling block for me, for you have set your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And then the rest of the air escapes from the balloon. As Jesus goes on to say, you want the keys, huh? Then deny yourself and take up the cross and follow me. Those interested in saving their lives will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find them. Peter seems to know he, what he thinks. He seems to know what he means when Jesus means to be the Messiah. He thought it meant that the Messiah would come to restore the Jewish kingdom by overthrowing an oppressive Roman Empire. But now Jesus is talking about going to Jerusalem, suffering and dying. Jesus makes clear that he's reinterpreting their idea of Messiah by suffering and dying with his people. This was apparently past Peter's mental capacity at that point, at least. As my former professor, Dr. Tom Wong, says so well, a life that is spent soothing the pain of the sick, caring for the children in need, hammering nails in houses for those without shelter, sharing bread with the hungry, visiting those in prison and denying oneself may seem like a squandered life in the economy of a self-centered age. But in the storehouse of heaven, it is a lavish treasure. <clears throat> Many commentaries point out in our gospel text today that this is a turning point in the gospel of Matthew, the beginning of the end. But the end is really just a new beginning, isn't it? And yet so few Christians abandon everything for the sake of the gospel. Most of us simply fit our Christianity into our open spots on our calendar. But in this passage, Jesus links life of discipleship with his own path to the cross. You can find preachers who will tell you how to have your best life now, or eight steps to create your life that you want, and even life without limits. As you might imagine, those preachers are enormously popular. People pack stadiums to hear the message like that. But then comes along Jesus and says, those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. That's when the stadiums begin to empty out. It's not a very popular message. But maybe it's the only because so few people have ever really tried it. G.K. Chesterton said it this way, The Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. Today we are confronted with the gap between Jesus' gruesome fate and our own modest discipleship. So we face the chasm between Jesus' call to discipleship and our own lives as part-time volunteers for the gospel. I mean, really, it was hard stuff. It required great sacrifice. It was not the way of popular movement, but rather the polar opposite. It was difficult, a difficult path marked by disappointment, death, and pain. Jesus was going to undergo great suffering at the hand of those in power. Well, yeah, no thanks. Deny ourselves and abandon ambition and proven strategies of dashboard success in favor of putting ourselves on a cross to be publicly humiliated. Mm, I'll pass. Losing our lives and our pensions in pursuit of what he calls new life. I'm sorry, but no, that's not the life I had in mind. That's not the life my parents had in mind. I'm a Christian, but 
I'm not very different than most of you. I assure you that when it comes to John Wesley's path of holiness, I still have a long way to go. And yet, that's exactly the life, not only John Wesley, but Jesus calls us to pursue. It is important to note that a confession of faith in Christ is only the first step of discipleship. While it's important that we know in our minds who Jesus is, it's even more important that we, with our lives, live as Jesus taught. We are told in no uncertain terms to get behind him and to follow along. Notice that Peter never had any hope of understanding until he was behind him, following his way. That's the only position from you which you and I will ever learn abundant life, what abundant life is. That Jesus intends for us and models for us by standing behind Jesus, listening to him, watching him, following him as every move, trying to walk in his footsteps. How did Jesus teach discipleship? He just demonstrated it by the way he lived his life, and he told us to imitate his actions so closely as we can. So Jesus is clearly not a professor or a scribe who teaches about the church from a distance, but a good shepherd who lives and leads and feeds the sheep and heals the wounded and protects them from their enemies and sleeps in the same fold as them and is willing to lay down his life for them. Methodists are marked by a different set of values, a different set of priorities of lifestyle, a different way of being than other people, be they Christian or not. We are seeking after holiness of heart and life in everything we do. And it's not that easy always. It means that others may find our practices out of step with popular culture, counter to consumerist values and lifestyles, and seeking after a life that's not compatible with what's being taught by the latest lifestyle guru. It means that our growth is rooted deep in commitment and discipleship, and transformation both inward and outward. A seeker once gave this report on his own quest. First, I tried to find myself, but have never succeeded. Then I sought for God, after God, but I could not find God. Finally, I pursued the good of my neighbor. And then I found all three. Many people have experienced that when they did everything they could to be happy, to find so-called happiness of this world, the good life. They could never find it. It was empty. But when they tried to pursue the good of others, their neighbor, they found that the way that leads to life was abundant. This has been perhaps one of the most beautifully expressed in the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi, which says, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Lord, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled, but to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. And for it is in giving that we receive. And in its pardoning that we are pardoned. And it's in dying that we are born to eternal life. The way to life goes through death. I think if Peter were here, he would have a message for us. Baptist pastor Jim Somerville imagined that he would have some advice for us today. He says, Peter might say, I've always done it, I've done it both ways. I've thought the thoughts of men, and I've tried to save my own life. I've trembled at the fear of death, but something happened to me on that first Easter. When I saw the risen Lord, I realized that death had been defeated. I didn't have to be afraid of it anymore. If God could raise Jesus, he could raise me too. And so, on that day of Pentecost, I stood before the crowd in Jerusalem and told them that they were the ones that had killed the Son of God. I could hardly believe I said it. They might have taken offense. They might have killed me as well. But for whatever reason, I didn't care anymore. I almost dared them to do it. And for the first time in my life, I had the courage to say everything on my mind. And believe me, it was plenty. I told those people all about Jesus. I told them what they had done to him was wrong. I told them they needed to do something to be, set things right. And I told them they needed to repent and be baptized. And you know what? What it was like? It was like 
I was a different person. That old fearful Peter, the one who denied Jesus, was dead and gone. Like a caterpillar, he had crawled into a cocoon and a butterfly had come out. I had lost my old life, but had found a new one to put on in its place. It was an incredible thing in the world. I felt like I could fly, and that's when I remembered what Jesus said on the road to Caesarea Philippi. Those who want to save their life will lose it, but those who lose their life for my sake will find it. I lost my old life, and I am a new man today. So let's get behind Jesus and follow where he leads. Let our old life die and let our egotism and selfishness wither away. Resurrection and new life comes when we become part of Christ's body, acting in the world for others. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now let us go to God as we sing our hymn of response. Please come forward. God of power and might, we, like Peter, struggle with the image of a Savior sent to suffer and die. We may seem to be doing great in following Christ, but we too stumble at this point. Perhaps we stumble because we know that what follows is Christ's call to us to deny ourselves and pick up a cross of our own in order to follow. As we bring gifts for the word of building your kingdom, use them for ministries of hope through our church and into our community, nation, and world. Help us to learn to deny, carry, and follow. Bless these gifts lovingly offered and all of us here. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.
be seated. Receive this invitation to the table. All are welcome at this table. From the beginning of time, God has fed the people. From the fruit of the garden of the, to the manna in the desert, to meals that call us to remember the stories of divine activity of liberating people from oppression. Today, Jesus is the host of this meal, and all are invited to this table. Let us join together in our great thanksgiving. God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to God. We praise you, Almighty God, for all who labor for the common good and those whose service is unappreciated. We thank you for, the, for children whose play is the work of learning to live in the world you've created. We thank you for disciples who are obedient to the promptings of your spirit in all their relationships. We thank you for your yearning and mercy that waits us for us to make our own hours, days of participation in your healing and blessing of the earth and all people. You made us in your image and set us in the lush garden as caretakers. When we chose to have it all to ourselves, you turned our freedom into the toil for survival. When we cried out our misery, you delivered us from captivity and made covenant to be our sovereign God. By the prophets, you called us to return to you and delight in the good food without price. You comforted us in waste of labor apart from you and asked us, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Incline your ears and come to me and listen so that you may live. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Anointed with your spirit, his labor was to do your will and to complete it. He took the common things of daily life and blessed them and broke it and shared them so that all were satisfied. And he told those who followed him, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up, Jesus gathered with his friends. He took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his followers saying, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and he said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. Therefore, holy God, grant that in praise and thanksgiving we may be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable in your sight, that our lives may proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until we feast at that heavenly banquet together. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, your holy church, all honor and glory yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now let us join together as we sing the Lord's Prayer responsively.
because there is one loaf, many of we are, are one body, for all partake of the one loaf, though we come to the table as hurting and broken individuals. It's through participation in the body of Christ that we find wholeness. Thanks be to God. The couple which we share is a sharing in the new life in Christ, and we drink in the blessings of God. Thanks be to God. The table is set. The feast is ready. All are invited. We have our helping hands baskets over here and our gluten-free option if you like. Come and receive.
And now let us join together in our close. No, let's join together in the prayer after receiving. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now I invite you to stand as we sing our hymn of discipleship. Then we'll do the benediction. join together in closing benediction. Jesus has called you and placed his trust in you. We go into this world bearing the words of hope and healing. Reach out to others in compassion. It's it in Jesus', Jesus name that we, that we are sent out to serve. Amen. Now go forth in the peace of Christ, loving God and serving your neighbor in all that you do. Amen.